ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time to start. So, my name is uh, Katja Paulavets. I am from the International Council for Science. And on behalf of the organizers of this side event, which include uh, ICSU, then the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, the Inter-American Institute for Global uh, Change Research, uh, World Climate Research Program, and the Working Group uh, 1 of the IPCC, I would like to welcome you to our side event on the urgencies in fundamental climate research following um, the Paris Agreement. As you all know, science played a key role in building understanding and raising awareness of the global change challenges that eventually led to the adoption of the agreement. And all organizers of this side event, as well as speakers, contributed to the generation and the assessment of climate science. ICSU, for instance, has been involved in uh, climate uh, research since 50s, and uh, we promote an international research collaboration through, through International Geophysical Year and Polar Years. We also created with other partners major global research programs such as WCIP, SCAR, some of them are represented here on the panel, and also Global uh, Climate Observance System and recently Future Earth. So now the Paris Agreement um, challenges the scientific community to look forward and to explore new horizons for climate research. And the goal of this side event is actually to outline key broad and urgent questions to focus on for scientific community. So we have the pleasure today to have with us uh, uh, Valérie Manson Delmont, who is a co-chair of uh, Working Group 1 of the IPCC, and David Carlson, who is a director of WCAP, as moderator of this uh, side event. And I would like to pass now the floor to them. David, please. Thank you, Katya. Welcome. Um, we hope you enjoy this. Uh, uh, we hope you enjoy this little session. We want to bring you um, a view of science. Um, I like the way Katya introduced these organizations. World Climate Research Program has the mission to analyze and predict present and future climate, but by partnering with ICSU, who has the mission to internationalize science, you see how we work together. And then the two uh, co-agencies, um, the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research, SCAR, and the Inter-Americas Institute, IAI, um, take this combination of excellence and collaboration to regional, and you're gonna see a little bit of tropical and you'll see a little bit of Antarctica. So we like this uh, overall comp uh, composition of the panel. Um, we are addressing urgencies in fundamental research, um, despite Whatever the news says, the climate system doesn't listen to agreements. And if you're watching to uh, 2016, you know that the climate system has surged together, surged forward on many fronts. Um, we also will need understanding and predictive skill to implement the Paris Agreement. And I, I think you'll hear from all of the speakers um, exactly how the climate community is responding to that. Um, definitely. This research that we're talking about informs the national, regional, and international assessments. And we have Valerie uh, Maison Delmont as chair of Working Group One, and she will chair the second half of this. Um, and then there's a fundamental need to understand climate and the climate signals if we're going to build uh, credible and effective adaptation and mitigation strategies. So I'm going to introduce then quickly the first four speakers. Um, they'll each shift so they can run the controls from the central computer. Um, we have Joachim Maratsky um, from uh, Max Planck Institute. His interest and expertise is in oceans and ocean climate. Um, we have Borum Lee from WCRP. Um, she's going to talk about a WCR program on water availability for what we call the breadbasket regions. Um, Irene represents the Antarctic research community, and she'll talk about marine plankton and, and um, ecosystem services in, in the Southern Ocean. And Artiro represents the land use, land change community, and he'll talk about biodiversity and habitat loss in the tropical region. So we've tried to give you a, a, a cross cut of the kind of urgent science that's going on across the climate community. So with that, um, Joachim, please. Let's 
screen. Doesn't. Good afternoon. Um, I'm speaking here on behalf of a small working group that was assembled by the World Climate Research Program and the International Council for Science Unions to think out of the box about the future of uh, fundamental climate research. And the motto that we chose uh, was climate research must sharpen its view. Sorry that Our starting point was that um, the Paris Agreement has liberated climate research in the sense that we no longer need to discuss what we already know. The world is warming and humans are largely responsible. So now we must define the next research frontier for fundamental research and we must probe deeper into the unknown. And we argue that the basic, the fundamental climate research can sharpen its view through three very simple yet very powerful guiding questions. And these guiding questions are, where does the carbon go? How does the weather change with climate? And how does climate influence the habitability of Earth and its regions? So why these questions and uh, what do they imply? When we say the carbon, it's the anthropogenic carbon. We must, of course, know where the anthropogenic carbon goes because uh, the pledges uh, to reduce emissions need to be verified. We need to observe the fate of the anthropogenic carbon. I see this as an analogy to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty 20 years ago, which required verification observations through the seismological networks uh, so that small earthquakes could be separated from nuclear explosions. And a similar, in principle, a similar strategy has to be pursued to follow the anthropogenic carbon. Why is this difficult? The input of anthropogenic carbon into the system occurs against the background of a very, of a highly variable natural carbon cycle. Two examples, when there is an ENSO, an El Nino event, land uptake on carbon changes uh, from one year to the next. Um, or we know that the largest single carbon sink on Earth, the Southern Ocean, which takes up a lot of carbon, shows variability on the multi-year to decadal time scale. So if you want to analyze where the anthropogenic carbon goes, we need to factor in these elements of natural variability. The weather is what we experience day to day, month to month, year to year. The weather is difficult to predict in its statistics how it changes with climate change because thermodynamics and circulation change hand in hand, circulation, atmosphere and ocean. And we know that the circulation changes are particularly difficult to predict in a changing climate. They are particularly uncertain. And uh, the, one of the challenges is that the, to understand and to predict the regional circulation, regional weather, uh, we have to use models that are much more finely resolved than we currently can. So there's a very fundamental technological and scientific challenge for us. The third question, habitability, the, the basic question is what societies can adapt to or cannot adapt to. Uh, for example, temperatures might rise so much that we reach the, the human physiological limit to heat stress. Water availability may be threatened uh, because the water cycle will change in a changing climate and sea level uh, may, may rise and inundate uh, coastal regions. We are sure that some of these things will happen, but we are very, very unsure of where and when they will happen, and that's a particular challenge. So we believe that these guiding questions can help us shape the research agenda in fundamental research, uh, but they are also at the heart of what society needs to know if they want to prepare for the climate change. But truth be told, society may not know always that they should ask these questions and should know it but they do. And we do have to base the information that we give to society on a much more robust foundation than we currently can because of the scientific challenges inherent. 
But we also believe that we can provide this better foundation, that we can mobilize the human spirit. And the essential aspect is to bring new talent into climate research. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, my name is Boram Lee uh, from uh, World Climate Research Program. Uh, just following those three quick questions on, uh, on, on carbon, weather, and toward habitability, I just wanted to introduce uh, briefly as an example one of those collaborative research efforts from the climate research community uh, to address those uh, scientific questions uh, to, to really set forward to improve the water availability for the food basket regions of the world. Um, just uh, wanted to replace my introductory comment uh, with this, uh, this uh, um, self-explanatory video uh, showing from, introduced from the, uh, the, uh, our colleague in the University of South Queensland. Uh, can you please uh, switch the sound to the computer? Okay, apologies, this, it, this doesn't work. Uh, I will inter have a find a way to uh, make this media available for all of you. Uh, just wanted to say that the, uh, the productability and, uh, and well, toward the food security, especially the availability and stability, they are very much affected by uh, climate, especially the water availability, uh, the uh, impacted and changes by climate, climate extremes and climate changes. So in there, uh, the, uh, what we try to address through this, uh, this grand challenge among, you know, from the scientific point of view is uh, try to offer a solution uh, on uh, how to improve the, uh, the water security, for the, especially for the, for the food, uh, to secure food production. So we identified these, uh, these key questions for the grand challenge, how will a warming world affect the available fresh water resources globally and regionally? And how does those uh, translate specifically to the food basket regions of the world? So of course, within this context, we are focusing on geophysical process and the anthropogenic influence on, uh, on, the, uh, on, uh, on the food production. Uh, so to do so, Naturally, we need both regional, regional approach and scientific approach. We are made aware recently of this uh, new paradigm on uh, with climate change, dry gets drier and wet gets wetter. wetter. Recent research showed that this, um, this paradigm is, uh, is, uh, is validated for those, especially about the, uh, the humid region in high altitude and some of those arid regions in subtropics. But in globally, we have so much of uncertainties. And this goes down to the need for, we have to improve our understanding of what will happen regionally. And at this, so, so this grand challenge, we focus on those major food producing regions of the world, starting from the Great Plain in North, uh, North America and, uh, and the Pannonian Basin in the Eastern Europe, and also uh, the, uh, the South Asian food, uh, the rice and wheat uh, production region. And of course, we are hoping that these, uh, these scientific findings can extend this benefit toward the old world food processing regions of the world. Uh, in the research topic, we identified the three main topics uh, for, for to start. First, how we integrate human dimension the water management in a large scale model. And secondly, how do we simulate and predict the, uh, the precipitation close to the observation, close to the real 
our patterns. And the, and the, in that sense, it is very, very important. We, ha we improve our modeling technology in the complex terrain, including the convection. And the secondly, the, uh, the land use effect and the, the, uh, the interaction of land atmosphere toward climate in, uh, in, in, um, and, and to simulate and understand better in a regional and uh, global uh, context. So in there, it is, it is critical that these efforts, research efforts, should build up on existing efforts within and beyond the WCLP with all these research in, uh, in water science, climate science, and, uh, and also the, uh, the agriculture and other related areas. And we continue our effort to work together with those uh, identified uh, international research program and the national uh, experts. Uh, just uh, it's, uh, it's, there is no need to explain that. This research effort is uh, touching on nearly everything, if, well, if not all, nearly uh, many those uh, sustainable development goals. And uh, this, uh, I will leave uh, from here for the further discussion with you. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. I'm uh, Irene Schluss from the Instituto Antartico Argentino, but here I am representing the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, and I will try to answer to the questions we've just heard about, but from an Antarctic perspective. Um, on the question on how the weather, how will the weather change, we have to think that Antarctica is already the coldest, the driest, the highest continent, and in this sense, it's a land of extremes. Um, on the other hand, it's a continent that has not for a long time having um, data series, meteorological data series. We can have proxies, but uh, large series are not available. So it is difficult to distinguish between uh, anthropogenic change and natural variability. For, for instance, in the Western Antarctic Peninsula, that could be the case. So it is, it is very important for us to, to uh, see when, to understand how the new climate patterns will behave. <coughs> Thank you. And um, have the, the new patterns arrive uh, fast and uh, understand the scales in which the weather will change. On the question on where will the carbon go, as, as my colleague here mentioned, uh, the Southern Ocean is already a, an important sink of carbon, mainly via uh, two different pumps, what we call the physical pump, which is the physical transportation of water via deep water formation well, uh, and ventilation, the balance between these two processes, and biological carbon pump, which is explained by the, the activity, the biological activity of the organisms in the surface waters in the ocean. And uh, recently we've seen that uh, there, have been a, there has been a shift in the southern hemisphere and western, is there shift, a latitudinal shift and a, a shift in intensity, which uh, is, is changing the balance between these two pumps. Uh, usually the physical pump would be responsible for one third of the carbon sink, while uh, now with this shift, it could be competing with, uh, bi with biology. And of course, uh, biology is also affected by, by temperature, but seawater, surface seawater temperature which is the part that's most, most affected. So this is also something we need to understand further. When we think about habitability, it's a special case because there is a treaty, there is an environmental protection treaty, what we call the Madrid Protocol, which protects Antarctica, which we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have a, pr a protocol like this for the rest of the planet. But uh, yeah, the, it protects the, uh, the environment and uh, it comes uh, protecting the 8,000 uh, marine species and 1,000 terrestrial species we have there, although, although there are many risks for these species. And um, it, is, it is more related to extreme events that, uh, that could produce changes, shifts, important shifts in communities that we have to look at. And uh, of course, the rates of change in the environmental conditions is something we really have to look at. Um, this 
I've, I've been in any in, any, in all of my slides. I've been talking about scales, and this is this is something I really want to emphasize: the scales at which processes occur. Here in this in this figure, you have the exact the time scale and the space scale has no unit because it depends on the species we are consider or the group of organisms we are considering. But uh, this the stress uh, can go from time very short time scales from seconds to minutes to many years depending on the biological processes we are looking at and it's not not so much the variation in the mean conditions that will affect them but thresholds and limit values that could push the communities toward limits where we could severely affect biodiversity so what were what well, I just said this. What are we doing in the frame of the Scientific Committee of Antarctic Research? We gathered uh, two years ago for uh, scanning the horizon to start to think about the questions that we would want to answer in 2020 and beyond. Uh, and uh, for the next 50 years, this was an international interdisciplinary uh, event uh, where we thought about different groups. There are several papers that have been published about that and we are really thinking interdisciplinary in the sense that we are trying to gather biologists and climatologists and glaciologists although I'm not speaking about glaciology you'll have a talk in a few minutes so uh, this is this is the way we are doing and this is a way we should continue to go thank you Good afternoon. Um, I'm Arturo Sanchez Azofeifa. I'm a professor at the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Science at the University of Alberta, and I'm here representing the Inter-American Institute for Global Change uh, Research, uh, specifically one of our one of their projects called Tropic Dry, which is a uh, human and biophysical dimensions of tropical dry forests in the Americas. Uh, I would like to focus this presentation on, on one of the questions is where the carbon goes. And uh, my argument is that we don't know that much about where it goes in Latin America. When we look at the current distributions of uh, carbon flux systems in Latin America, compared with North America or even in, in, in Europe, uh, of this 570 17 active worldwide flux net sites, only 25 are in Latin America. It's fundamentally clear that uh, uh, also that a lot of this information comes from tropical rainforests and very little information comes from tropical dry forests, which we call probably one of the most forgotten tropical ecosystems. Uh, if I talk to you about the tropics, where your mind goes, it goes right away into the Amazon. And we forgot uh, other key elements. Of course, this brings a lot of uncertainties and uh, also bring a significant amount of uh, problems to uh, global modeling uh, in terms of uh, how tropical ecosystems are responding to climate change. And, and I will also argue that this actually makes a very difficult uh, task to actually validate current remote sensing missions because we really don't have enough information from other sites besides the Amazon basin. Uh, on the other hand, we are constantly living with the issue, uh, at least myself, with questions about things that happen, rather than things that are happening. So it's not all the time that we have extreme droughts and we learn about the effects six months or a year after. So we really need to start thinking about that analytic approaches are necessary to satisfy some of these urgencies coming out of the fundamental climate research. So we move from this paradigm that we have, and it's called probably the fourth paradigm of science that is starting to emerge right now, in which we really need to have what is happening right now to make smart decisions uh, in the long term. 
Uh, this is a key example of some of these uh, fundamental questions for Latin America. For example, how tropical ecosystems are responding in terms of carbon sequestration. Are they sequestering more? Are they releasing more carbon? Are we gaining more carbon? We really don't know. I mean, there is so much secondary growth happening, so much deforestation, that at the end of the day, we we'll just come back with, a, a, in many cases, a national estimates that are based on Excel forms to estimate those things. Let me give you an example. In the upper right, in, the, in this curve in the top, you have the phenological response of a tropical dry forest in Costa Rica. The first year of phenological response is the year of what we call a normal year. The second year is with one of the largest droughts in the last 50 years in Central American region is starting to occur. And the third year is the year of the full drought. So this is the technological response. So what is happening is, what we are observing is a decrease in the growing season of tropical dry forests. And in the bottom is the carbon response. So the one in red is the total uh, primary productivity, gross primary productivity uh, being uh, observed in the dry forests of Costa Rica during a normal year. The one in blue is the one during the drought and the one in uh, green is the top of the ground. Fundamental question is, how these changes affect carbon accounting? How these changes affect payments for environmental services? Those are fundamental questions that we cannot answer right now. We can answer for some sites, but we cannot answer for the whole tropics. And that has significant economic consequences in the long term. So I have a, a, a five point take home message here. And I think that they, I was talking already before about the need for analytics and the necessity to have a paradigm shift in the way that we're starting to see things. I started to think more about the internet of things when we talk about environmental monitoring. Also, it's fundamentally clear that we have great advances in, in carbon monitoring in North America with the Ameriflux or the, or the um, in ICOS, but we don't have a Latin flux. It doesn't exist at this time. And um, I think that this is a falls right into the hands of and the lap of Latin American countries, governments that must invest in basic climate research associated to carbon sequestration. Thank you very much. Thank you, my friends. Uh, it was great fun to show you these little bits of climate research that are going on. Um, next, I'm going to turn to my friend and colleague, Valerie, Mom uh, and ask her from her view of working group one to give her give us her sense of, of what the what the urgencies look like. Do you want to do you want to work from here, Val? I'm going to move here because then I will chair the, the, the panel discussion and we need to make room for all the panel participants. Um, what I would like just to say on behalf of the IPCC working group one is that the IPCC is uh, supposed to assess the state of scientific knowledge based on publications. And it's well known for the key points, the key conclusions from the summary for policymakers. But if you look at the last assessment report, for instance, in the technical summary, the last section is focused on where do we have low confidence? Where are the key uncertainties? And there's a clear list of a few points that clearly echo to the presentations given today. Gaps in observations, for instance, with respect to dryness or ocean and atmospheric circulation or the deep ocean. Gaps for drivers of climate change, especially the role of aerosols and the interactions with clouds, the role of the carbon cycle feedbacks, and gaps in understanding with, again, the role of clouds, um, um, ability to relate human influence and many aspects of the water cycle. Many aspects of the Antarctic climate are still very poorly understood. And there are also gaps in projections. To give a few examples, ice sheet dynamics and sea level rise. Um, what can be the change in variability from day to day for extremes and for year to year in a changing climate? Or what would be the carbon release when permafrost is thawing? These are just a few examples that were stressed in the last IPCC report. 
And now we are at the onset of the sixth assessment cycle. We are having a number of scoping meetings preparing three special reports done for 1.5 degrees Celsius. So now we have the first call for authors um, ongoing for um, a special report on the ocean and the cryosphere, uh, ongoing for a special report on issues related to desertification, land use, food security and scheduled next May for the main assessment report. And when we do this scoping exercise, planning the structure of reports scheduled for 2018, 2019, and 2021, we need to be informed of what is emerging, especially at the state of fundamental research, that will be key for the new knowledge that we will have to convey through the IPCC reports very broadly, and especially to policymakers. So this is what I wanted to mention in the way the IPCC is deeply concerned by um, this ability to stimulate uh, new research in the context of the Paris Agreement. And for that, I suggest that we now have um, the panel discussions and um, we have already our four speakers and three persons will join us. Fatima Driouesh from Morocco. So Fatima is the head of the National Climate Center in Morocco. And she's particularly interested by the relationship between climate change and extreme events, as well as forecasting extreme events. Um, I would also like to invite Erika Kay, uh, the executive director of the Belmont Forum Secretariat. Um, that is a group of world's major and emerging funders of global environmental um, change research. So Erika, you are welcome in the panel. And finally, Wilfram Mufumaokia, so, Villefranc is the head of science for the IPCC Working Group 1 Technical Support Unit. He's initially from the Republic of, of Congo, and he has a background in climate and, and weather modeling, uh, with a strong involvement in um, African climate. So, with that, I would like to give the floor to uh, those who have just joined the panel uh, for a discussion on how do we go forward. And, of course, how do we go forward means what are the needs for specific research related to the questions that have been raised? Carbon, weather, habitability. What does the scientific community need to do? How to attract a new generation of scientists? And what is the perspective from the funding agencies? So maybe I would like to invite Fatima to start. Thank you, Valérie. So I uh, would uh, I would like to uh, talk starting from the uh, uh, the aspect linked to uh, extreme weather and uh, climates. As we know, all uh, weather and climate extremes are becoming more and more uh, frequent and severe with climate change, and uh, their impacts are generally bad and sometimes very very bad, as we know all. I think uh, there is still need for more developments and work in order to enhance the quality and the robustness of forecasts of extreme events and uh, extreme events at different uh, skills. I mean, weather and uh, climate uh, skills. And this is uh, needed to help for a better risk management a better, uh, for a reduction of uh, negative impacts of such events. And uh, to do so, I think there is a room for a better understanding of local processes and feedbacks. And also there is need for a denser and a higher quality observation networks, especially in the regions with need like, uh, for example, Africa. Uh, also, uh, I think uh, there is uh, also room for more and uh, better uh, assessment and prediction of potential impacts of these uh, events to allow efficient adaptation of communities and socio-economic sectors to climate change. So also enhancing literature production on impacts and vulnerabilities, especially in developing uh, and least developed regions and countries, I think will have a real added value uh, in this regard. Uh, also the integration of research institutions from developing countries 
into national and international programs should uh, be very helpful to for all i think and uh, also there is need for uh, efforts uh, for all the efforts including young gener generation and in my point of view uh, to attract young, young generation young generations to participate to such research and works uh, there is need for more communication about its usefulness in saving people and property and also communication about what we exactly know and what we still need to know and why. And I would like to thank you. Thank you very much, Fatima. Um, maybe, Wilfran, you would like to echo to the, to the, the, the presentation, the brief presentation of priorities from Fatima, still with the perspective of, of physical science. Thank you very much, Fatima, uh, uh, Valérie, sorry. Um, I think I would like first to start with a different stance, maybe a bit provocative here, and uh, I will try to put my heart of a person who has been working with the developing country, particularly in Africa. Essentially, if you read carefully the question put upon us by the panel. My reading is that uh, the key challenge here is do we need to have a right balance between the climate science knowledge and the policy dialogue? In other words, do we want the climate research agenda to be driven by our government to serve the society, to put it simply, or do we want the climate research agenda to be led, driven by research, in a kind of what I will call curiosity-driven research agenda. I think it's a bit of both, and Africa is an area where the two views need to be balanced. Now, uh, to come back to the question put upon us here, uh, my answer will be if uh, we want to stay in an African context, what is really needed in terms of research are uh, what I will call more research on, the, on assessing the local to regional response of climate change and uh, um, uh, as uh, Hoke put uh, previously, is uh, how does the weather react and uh, uh, a changing climate? And uh, associated with that is um, the issue of uh, risk and um, impact, more specifically when we are thinking of moving toward more mitigation-driven uh, scenario. Now, for, to clarify my view here, if you recall um, the, the outcome of the Paris Agreement, and essentially the Paris Agreement had, has put the climate research com community in a very challenging uh, place because the Paris Agreement is looking for us to shift or to change the way we are thinking. And if you recall, um, generally, the, the way traditionally climate scientists used to think about climate projection was to say we think about a change uh, by considering two specific uh, time periods, one in the present, one in the future, under a certain emission scenario. Now, what the Paris Agreement is saying, you need to think about the mitigation adaptation uh, uh, problem through a process based on a global temperature target. And this is tricky because, as many of you recall, it's difficult for precipitation to be correlated with the temperature growth. So basic, basically for different emission scenario for a set of given temperature, you might have different behavior in terms of precipitation. But I will skip the technical detail. Now, <laughs> if I want to lay down uh, some, uh, if you like, direction for the research, A, and it was mentioned uh, by the previous speaker, would be the ability to provide specially detailed, uh, physically based model. So, which means cl a climate model uh, with uh, high resolution, more process, and so forth. And the second issue, which is uh, not less important, is to try to be able to um, disentangle the contribution of uh, uh, model uncertainty versus uh, natural viability. And I try to explain here, simply, if you recall the CIMIT-5 model, which are the bulk of the IPCC AR5 uh, projection, what you realize, uh, those uh, projections are scenario or concentration-driven scenario. 
And um, what we realize, if you take the lowest end of the emission scenario, the RCP 2.6, there are a bulk of evidence indicating that those scenarios will stabilize around 2.3, 2.4 degree at the end of the century, right? Now, if we were to change the way we design scenario, we might also think about how we assess the, uncertainty, the model uncertainty, because remember, in the case of semi-5 model, when we are targeting the end of the century, with all the evidence we have, there are indications that... Uh, what is happening at those time scale? What is very important are the model uncertainty versus the uh, uh, internal viability. So, if we have to change the timeline, so the, all the time scale will overlap. So, we need to put on the table new science, new method to assess the the the, or if you like, to dis, to, to 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 understand the noise uh, signal to noise ratio. That's one one hand. Now, so how we can bring uh, more uh, young generation of scientists, and I think here where the African context play uh, can provide a good example, because if we admit that what is relevant is to put, as I heard in Africa, don't do the science for the sake of science, do the science which is useful. So if we keep that paradigm, what is important uh, for us to bring more scientists is to show or to communicate about the uh, what we know in terms of science, what we don't know, and what the science can provide to the society. And I think that will help to bring more uh, young scientists into the picture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Villefranc. And uh, the final word before giving the floor to the audience for questions will be to Erika Key to have the perspective of the funding agencies that is, of course, critical for development and progress in research. Thank you. So I'm heartened by the discussion from my pan, uh, fellow panelists thus far, and I'm heartened because these priorities that have been shared are all areas that we are currently funding within the Belmont Forum. Now, the forum is a partnership of funding agencies and ministries, and we collaborate together to advance interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary science in global challenges. And this is important, they are global challenges. Any one agency or one country cannot accomplish the level of uh, forward uh, momentum that is needed to address some of these rapid and, and future changes. So the forum uh, definition of fundamental research includes the collaborative efforts of natural scientists, social scientists, and end users or stakeholders on every project that we fund. We achieve this through a virtual common pot. We don't pool monies together. Uh, each interested agency or ministry comes with a budget to the table to support their eligible communities. And uh, this allows us, through the collaboration, to uh, reduce the stress of double jeopardy in competing processes. Um, we, to date, have contributed over 100 million euros to areas uh, relevant to many researchers here, such as coastal vulnerability, freshwater and food security, mountain ecotones, biodiversity and ecosystem services, Arctic resilience, and most recently more than 20 million euros were awarded to multinational projects in climate predictability and interregional linkages. We have two calls coming out in December focused on transformations to sustainability, which is led by ISSC, the International Social Science Council, in the scoping process, but again requires the contribution of natural science, social science, and end users to develop the, uh, or co-develop the approaches and co-implement the science so that it is more uh, rapidly uptake, um, rapidly taken up through human action and adaptation to global change. So as we move forward with the Belmont Forum and growing uh, each year, we just brought on board five more members. We have had more than 60 uh, science agencies and organizations participate in our calls as supporters of science. And uh, 
we continue to grow, but we, we recognize the need for training, capacity building to address the future calls uh, that look at things like the common system of the sustainable development goals, a very large task uh, that is reflected in the world in 2050, which we're looking to partner into. Uh, we're conducting transdisciplinary training activities with ISSC to sort of reduce that fear factor of working with stakeholders and end users. Uh, we're also uh, implementing an open data policy and uh, through the forum structure, introducing open data to a lot of countries and agencies that do not have open data policies. So I just wanted to offer um, this perspective that uh, we hear you. Uh, we work with experts, with boundary organizations, and we look at the common priorities held by scientific funders worldwide to develop these thematic areas that hopefully will address not only the details of the Paris Agreement, but some of the uh, potential impacts of climate variability and vulnerability in the globe and we'll work continuously with partners to ensure that the 75% of countries that fall within the low and middle income category are represented in our process and are able to uh, receive funding through our calls. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for these uh, three presentations. I think we can uh, uh, express this. And now I would like to open the floor to you in the audience for your questions. Um, I think we will try to take questions first one by one, and if there are too many questions, then three by three. So please raise your hands if you would like to start to launch this question game. Here. The microphone will come to you. If you can briefly introduce yourself and, and maybe precise to which person of the panel of the question is, will be is designed to. Thank you. My name is Jan Oliver Löfkam. I'm a science editor from the German News Agency for Science and Technology. And uh, I'm curious about your idea, Professor Mawrotsker, about the monitoring system similar to the seismological system for the nuclear test ban treaty. Uh, could you give us a short view on your vision, how it should look like, what you will measure? And uh, after the short description, it would be interesting what your colleagues are thinking about such a system. Thank you. Well, part, part of the effort exists already. What, what we try to do is from the measurements of the carbon concentrations, especially in the atmosphere, uh, to infer the fluxes, the exchanges between the surface and the atmosphere. So the analogy with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is more uh, on, on a philosophical and fundamental, level, not on a technical level. Um, and so you have the satellite measurements of the, of, of the carbon concentration, but you also have the local measurements, typically from flux towers, as they are called, that give us some estimate of the exchanges. And from that, you try to draw up budgets on an ever finer scale. Currently, the scale of the estimate is limited to subcontinental, say, say elements of the United States, you can do that. But obviously, for some of the verification effort, we, we need to get to a much smaller scale on that, which requires both improved technolo technology, but also improved measurements. And the other big unknown is there really the change in the ocean carbon sink. So, we, so all of this has to come together. So in brief, elements exist, but we need to refine this. And the challenges of that are huge. Would other members of the panel like to comment on, on the question? Uh, Irene? Try to speak. Hello? Oh, yeah, it works. <laughs> yes. Well, I can uh, only agree with, with what you say. Observing is key, uh, like uh, observing the ocean, observing the, the Earth, and, and in particular in the case of Antarctica, when we think of, of, of observing, it's mainly in the 
in the areas, in the coastal areas where most of the stations are located or maybe in one or two stations which are in the, in the continent, but it's a huge area that has no information. And so it would be essential to increase the amount of, of observing systems. Um, the same could say for ocean observing systems, valid for Antarctica, Subantarctica, but many other areas in the world. So I can't, I can't really say anything contrary. It's, we, need, we need to increase observations. Thank you. And Arturo, you also wanted to comment on, on the importance of, of the observing networks, I believe. Yes, uh, there are technologies evolving like wireless sensor networks that are starting to become extremely cheap for, for long-term monitoring. The fundamental problem that we have here is that, unfortunately, the, the science of monitoring lives in five-year cycles. And that those cycles are associated with funding agencies. So the question is, how can we move away from those five year cycles into something that is more stable. And a lot of these projects are mostly for demonstration. So trying to move away from these long-term systems into this long-term system is probably one of the most critical elements when we talk about monitoring. I don't think that the science is an issue or the technology is an issue. I think that the funding for long-term is the most fundamental issue here. Thank you very much. I would like to comment also that uh, one issue related to climate change that will have a priority for the IPCC is the issue of cities, and it's the same problem. There have been tests to monitor greenhouse gas emissions from cities, but not sustained on the long term. That is the scale that is needed also to assess um, efficiency of policies at the scale of large cities, for instance. Uh, so raise your hands if you would like to ask questions. So I see here and then on the first line and then in the back. Yeah, thanks for all your input. My, I am Johannes Kuhlmann. I work for the World Meteorological Organization for Climate and Water. And my question is how, how do you want to design linkages between the funding for fundamental science and the funding for all the climate um, adaptation, mitigation, all the climate finances that's now ongoing? Because what we really need is we need to do something now and those funds are starting now and how can we make sure that what you guys are planning and doing really makes an effort in uh, really makes an impact in one two three years on all those you know hundred billions that will float into all the countries that need to do something so where's the link between what you need to do as a fundamental research into what really needs to be uh, steered and guided and changed in all this climate financing and development world. Thank you. Who would like to try to answer to this challenging question? Johan? Yes. This is, of course, the $64,000 question and, and part of what we're doing is this very event. Uh, the, I, I alluded to that, so let me put it in more blunt terms, that if if all the funding went into answering questions that we already know how to pose them today, that would be a complete disaster. Mm. We have, when we do fundamental research, we have to address questions that no one knows yet, uh, or society doesn't know yet, that they should be asking. So that is part of what we are trying to draw up here, and also what we, why we had this out-of-the-box workshop. It's exactly to get the dialogue going, to say, tell society, look, there are some questions you don't know you, that you have them. And, and I think that is absolutely crucial uh, that, or in, in other words, that this is not business as usual, but we are defining new frontiers. Uh, and if you're in WMO, you know, of course, of the difficulty of linking weather to climate. There are new frontiers, but when it comes to climate change debate, the public discourse, the existence of these frontiers are not known to many people. So this is what we are trying to do. But absolutely no guarantees that this will succeed. Who else would like to, to make a complimentary answer? Erica? So within the Belmont Forum, we work a lot with Future Earth as a boundary organization for us to be able to um, communicate between funding uh, experts and stakeholders, which I'm using the term stakeholder in its broadest definition here. Uh, so we rely on those types of organizations to um, funnel 
from the grassroots up to funders and the pr priorities set by SDGs and other high level organizations back down into the scientific community and find that nexus point where we can work together and leverage programs and funds. Um, one of our mantras is be flexible. Um, we just have to find uh, the way to partners, you know, so that we make the most of the money, the programs, the time, and uh, using external partnership mechanisms, um, different phasing of funding, et cetera, um, so that we can achieve that uh, most urgent need and in a collaborative way and in a transparent way uh, so that the end results are immediately utilizable. Thank you. Any other uh, wish to answer? Yes. Um, Boran? Yeah, just wanted to elaborate from those uh, those two uh, excellent opinions that you know associated with uh, cost efficiency linkage. And, uh, and the effectiveness of uh, funding to adaptation and mitigation. Uh, the, the role of this uh, fundamental climate research is also to uh, continuously provide feedback on uh, how uncertain, what kind of uncertainty we are working on and uh, how they, we can improve this uh, efficiency and effectiveness uh, from improved science and knowledge. And uh, this, is, uh, this is somewhere we can find the linkage on. Thank you. So I suggest we move on to the next question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Charlie Kennell uh, from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And I wonder if I might be indulged in first making a comment on the analogy with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and then ask the panel the question I hope to ask. On the CTBT, uh, the issue had been, could you detect a clandestine uh, nuclear underground nuclear explosion of low yield and the question was not only uh, a question it was a question of building confidence amongst the parties to the treaty could you detect one in an unknown area were they reporting directly and so prior to the development of the treaty some private sources got together and built the beginning of the international global seismological network and this then provided enough confidence to the decision makers that there could be independent verification of the statements made by the individual parties to the treaty. And so I think the analogy then is in the area of climate, it's with space observations and projects like A-Gage, where you make independent measurements of the greenhouse gas concentrations, and together with weather measurements, you can make some inferences about sources, and the existence of such uh, a verification source that's independent and objective ought to build confidence amongst all the parties to the treaty. So I think that's my understanding of the importance of your remark. Now, my question is, I think to the whole panel, but I heard it said uh, and, uh, that we all understand that sea level rise will occur, and the re real question is when and where will it occur? And then, uh, and this is, I think, a, a, a places a strong requirement on climate modeling, but after that there's a question, when and where will the decision makers presented with this knowledge, how quickly will they be able to act? Because we know uh, that, that climate change, in the climate change era, delay itself is costly, and delay in decision making is costly. So isn't one more obligation of the science community to reach out to the decision makers and ask them, what will prompt you? What matters really to you? What impact of sea level rise is the one that will move you to make a timely decision to build, resi uh, to build resilience? And so I think the obligation to the of the science community is to extend itself socially and also intellectually into the areas of impacts, economics, and social response. So I'd like a response from the panel. 
So thank you for raising the issue of race against time between new knowledge and, and information relevant for decision makers. So I'm turning to the panel and would like to know who would like to let me take a shot at Charlie's question. Um, absolutely sea level, but in fact, sea level is the easy example. We have coastal engineers, we have port managers, we have people who built building runways on fill. Um, our ability to find stakeholders for the sea level problem is actually rather easy. I'm not saying we do it perfectly, but there are plenty of people who would listen if we declared this as a sea level uh, meeting, we would get a lot. I think the tricky bit is to take the questions that our, our science community correctly identifies as more hidden at the moment. Let's take permafrost carbon, for example, and say, while we're busy designing new ports and talking about coastal resources, etc., let's not forget about this other factor, and there could be several that will come to bite us. And I think it's science's mission not only to engage with the stakeholders on the obvious ones but to also be scientifically rigorous on the less obvious ones would one of you like to uh, express views on this question erica irena yeah so you hit at the very point of why we have the approach we do, why we require that triumvirate, um, and why we are now offering transdisciplinary training, uh, because uh, it is a new skill to learn, to bridge that divide, and uh, to work <clears throat> together, really, to frame the question together so that uh, you know there is a decision-making tool or a policy prescription or uh, some other result that uh, you know spurs action in whatever way it can and uh, i welcome you because we'll be very close to you uh, at fall age you we're actually having a special session on coastal vulnerability and freshwater security um, and I forgot to mention our second call that's coming out in December is the food, water, energy nexus in urbanized areas. So you can imagine the absolute necessity working in an urbanized area on these critical human needs, having that uh, interface uh, within the project from the very beginning. So we do hear you and that is why we operate the way we do. Thank you. I think, uh, Irena, you wanted to have a feedback? Just, uh, just a short comment. Uh, glacier melting and sea level increase, that's published, it's a, it's a publication, an important publication coming every once in a while. I couldn't tell exactly the frequency, but it's something that's known. I know, you mean, and it's, it's, it's not only because of uh, atmosphere heating, but also because of the water, the ocean heating. So uh, it's something that that governments could already take care of because that's known, it's, it's gonna happen. It's happening. Um, I think Joram or Villefranc? Joram and Villefranc. Sorry, I uh, won't be long here. Just trying to follow up on what was said by Mr. Here. Probably the question uh, beyond the sea level example is uh, applicable to everything. And just to pick up on this, what I was thinking is probably, and uh, that's an idea I forgot to put on the table, is, um, on thinking, in thinking on the way forward, what I would like to suggest, or probably would be for the climate uh, or the impact assessment modeling community to work more with the impact community. Because if you remember, I don't know, I don't want to put people in a bad mood here, but uh, quite often uh, our colleagues for the climate impact community have been using climate models which are not designed or fit for purpose. They were built and then they follow up. Maybe we need to revert the paradigm, mm. try to work together and come up with the key questions, the key tools. That was my view, if I may. Thank you. I think we take just the last answer so that we yeah, have time um, for further questions. I, I, I am not afraid of putting people in a bad mood, so I will do <laughs> that here. Um, I, actually, to address your question, I think we have to reach much more broadly into the interdisciplinary research and discourse than, than, than indicated. 
very often inaction on climate mitigation does not occur because of lack of knowledge. Take the German government. They know perfectly well that climate is changing. The IPCC reports are the official fundamental basis. And yet the German public is still waiting whether our uh, environmental minister will come up with a climate mitigation, climate protection plan for this very COP22. Currently there is none. This is not because of lack of knowledge, it's because uh, the, the economic and agricultural and transportation ministries have shot down the plan that the environmental minister, minister has put up. So it's not a question of lack of knowledge, it's a question of sort of political realizability. And this issue of what is realizable and why is a very, very deep political and social science question that has to be more in the mainstream of climate research. Thank you. So um, the lady here has been waiting for a long time for the next question. Hi, uh, my name is Kayla Hardy. I'm a physics and computer science undergraduate student at the University of Waterloo. And today it was mentioned in the panel that we need to encourage youth to join climate research. And I'm wondering uh, if the panel has any suggestions because personally I've been to many physics conferences and I've wanted to present some research on climate change, but normally they have categories and climate change is never one of them. There's astrophysics, there's quantum mechanics, and even computer science does amazing uh, climate change research. And I'm just wondering, I'm here representing the students and I want to be able to come back and be like, hey, all science people, like look at what all the cool things we can do in climate research, but I don't know what the best approach is and I want to help kind of close the gap here because there seems to be a bit of a gap. Thank you. Thank you. So I think Arturo would like to start. Uh, let's see. The. Yeah. Um, I think that you make a very good point, especially coming from computer sciences. Uh, when I deal with my colleagues in, in computer sciences, they always tell me, just give me the data and uh, I will find the pattern. And that, that's the end of it. And they, they don't look at processes. They don't look at what the data is going to be used for. Uh, and that has been very typical. They, from, from. So I think that we need to start first by talking to your professors and, and make them to change the paradigm the way that they're teaching you. So this, when they go and organize their meetings, they can actually put this context in, uh, in, in, the, different, in the different meetings that, the, that you guys are attending. Uh, but also, just to remind you that there is the American Geophysical Union meeting that every year has uh, 25,000 people and hundreds of uh, sessions that are open to everybody where you can submit papers there. So there is venues where you can actually go. What you need to do is basically to find where those menus are. And we are always love to have computer scientists because you can have tremendous uh, uh, skills that sometimes we don't have, but we need them, so we need you. So, but if you don't talk, we never know that you exist. So I encourage you to go to the AGU, especially to, to present your science. That would be really interesting. So who else would like to? OK, so Irene and then um, Boram. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, I think you addressed several different questions. One is the participation here in, in, in fora like this. Uh, to give you a place, but uh, there are many, many meetings in which uh, youth or early career scientists are really welcome on their special, like for, for polar sciences, there's the APEX, the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists, and it's all, there's always room for, for young scientists that are starting or students that want to present to do something. And this is, this is very encouraging. Maybe in your field, or there is no such an association, but I would encourage you to form one because this really helps a lot. But then the other problem we get, or actually uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to interest young students in following a scientific career period, that's it. And this is mainly because there's no job afterwards. You, 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 got, you may have a wonderful PhD, if you're lucky you get two or three postdocs and then then there's the gap. So financing, it's, it's another issue. Financing the continuity or allowing these people to have a long-term perspective and plan their research already at the postdoc with a longer-term perspective, that would, be, uh, that would be what the governments need, would need to finance. I think, Boram, you are next. Yes, just briefly, um, I was uh, keep looking at uh, Dave uh, while you're 
expressing your opinion and which we really appreciate. Um, in fact, uh, it's a, it, I think it's two-way interaction. It's while early career scientists, the young, uh, the youth, young generation are looking to ways to really express themselves and make their ways and make future careers. At the same time, the research community is looking to the younger generation to break the boundaries and uh, and our sort of conventional thought. And in fact, for example, in the, in the WCLP, we always have been talking about the climate science. We have to you know, break the boundary between weather and climate, between hydrology, between, uh, between social science and natural science. But actually what it has been happening actively was from the younger generation, early career scientists. Uh, there is one, uh, the uh, network of early career scientists that are working closely with uh, WCLP. And in there, for taking an example, we have uh, a very active architect working with climate scientists and uh, reflecting this future climate change into her design of buildings. And uh, this, this is something we always have been thinking about, but somebody who put it into action is younger generation. And in fact, the WCLP and the, actually Irene made an example of this apex uh, for the polar scientists. And we have those networks of early career scientists that the, uh, the research programs are actively supporting. And uh, we will be very glad to anybody who are interested working with, uh, with us. Johan, you also wanted to yeah. comment? V very briefly, just keep going. There will be <laughs> graduate school and then everything will change. The physics community is quite narrow-minded when it comes to that. I know that I once was a physicist. <laughs> and so, uh, but in, in our graduate school, we love getting the applications from the, if you wish, the, the very the, the basic, the foundational sciences. So uh, just keep going. I would like to come back also to this point. I work in a center doing basic physics research. And it goes from the scale of atoms to the scale of the universe. And, you know, planet Earth is just in between as a complex system with, a, with exciting scientific challenges that are well understood by those doing astrophysics or atom physics as a complex system with, you know, imperfect data, imperfect models and the need for new concepts. And I, I also wanted to mention that for the IPCC, including early career scientists is a challenge because you need to prove you're an expert of the field through publications to be selected as an, uh, as an author. But we, uh, we really would like to uh, follow the, what was done by working group two and three in the past, that they were inviting early career scientists on a volunteer basis to be what was called chapter scientists. So providing volunteer support for authors you know, for managing uh, references, for helping for figures. And that's also a nice way of engaging um, volunteer early career scientists in the work of the IPCC. Any other question from another person? And then we will come back to you if there is time. Yes. Hi, uh, Peter Feria from um, CDP, the former Carbon Disclosure Project. We are an NGO working with um, investors and business um, and working to get uh, transparency uh, on, on, on climate um, challenges. Uh, we, we use data to put that data at the heart of decision making by investors, policymakers and, and companies. And we think that climate science should definitely inform all that decision making. And I go back to this challenge, which is, let's say, the application of the fundamental knowledge that you are creating. Uh, we recently, uh, back in 2014, we used the work uh, uh, on, on climate modeling and the basic science on carbon budgets for example, to develop tools that allow companies to understand, uh, based on scenarios that are compatible to, with the RCP 2.6, um, where they should be heading in terms of emissions reductions. Um, we, we have used that as a basis of a campaign that is promoting action 
by uh, many of the world's largest companies. And I think it's a bit of, of this that we need more. We need to think of climate science and then, you know, as re uh, fundamental research, but think of a pipeline of applied research. Uh, how can we apply it to products that really influence not only, you know, policymakers, but companies, investors, consumers, the, the, the general audience. And I, I was very happy to hear about the um, like ch uh, change in philosophy in terms of the funders uh, approach. Um, but I would like to hear from you uh, your challenges in terms of, you know, getting these to the point of application. Um, thank you. Thank you. So I'm turning to the panel to see who would like to react first on this issue of uh, translating both the outcomes and the needs of fundamental research for other audiences, including the business sector. Um, Fatima first, and then Wilfran. Yeah. yeah, just, just, just quickly. I agree that uh, uh, scientific community has developed a lot of tools, lot of, uh, lot of useful tools, and has. A, uh, uh, rich a lot of uh, knowledge sure there is uh, there is need for more knowledge but uh, there is also need uh, for uh, more application for uh, more help uh, uh, to the partners to the final users uh, on how they can integrate these uh, uh, outputs this uh, information this uh, data and uh, how to take benefits from the tools developed by, by the climate uh, uh, community. Uh, so I agree that there is an added value if we uh, work on uh, how to deal with the, this uh, aspect uh, and to uh, bring together climate scientists and the final users uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, reach the final link of the chain, the chain, and then to uh, uh, reach our uh, our uh, goal. I think, which is uh, uh, dealing with the, th the climate change uh, challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. I think Wilfran, you are next, and then I have seen also Irene and Arturo willing to provide their answers. Thank you very much for your very insightful question. Uh, just uh, a bracket, before moving to the IPCC, I used to work for the United Nations Economic Commission, where actually the question you raised was the main question. Now, the trick, or if you like, the trouble is, from that angle, what people want is to, for climate science to serve services. That's one of them. But what people tend to forget before you turn your knowledge or your climate science knowledge into a usable product, put it bluntly, there is a long series of fundamental research. We need to be backing your stuff. Now, the stand Africa is taking, and that's probably uh, something we need to revisit at some point, is that quite often the demand for the policymaker is to put product on the table. So they will find us, and you see, and uh, that's probably unfortunate, different uh, stakeholder um, development agencies, Sweden, France, putting money on the table for usable climate science product, but forgetting about the science which is needed behind. So we need to strike a balance, or we are not able to communicate to the donor what is really needed before we turn into product. But again, that's a debate. And just next door, there is the GFCS, the Global Framework for Climate Services, which is also thinking about it. But again, from the GFCS point of view, what is really interesting, they are backing their product by the science. Thank you. Thank you. Irene? Yes, I just wanted to comment. Uh, more and more, the funding agencies are asking us to provide uh, uh, projects that are na uh, from natural sciences, so social scientists, and that include stakeholders. As Erika just mentioned, it's 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 a new trend. It's new, relatively new. I happen to work uh, for some time in Quebec, and in Quebec, it's like obligation. You have to you have to do it like this, otherwise you won't get funded. But then you have a problem. We have a problem, and this is a mea culpa I'm doing. It is not easy for us to work with social scientists and to work with stakeholders. 
It's really we have to learn a new language, we have to share, we have to understand each other. That's not an easy task, it's a new vocabulary that we have to develop. And if you then combine it with the with a private or with a, someone working in the industry or, or the common the common person in the street, then, then you have a, an additional challenge because you have to modify your language again. But this is something we are facing more and more because otherwise, and I, I agree, some, some fundings require it and you won't get funded unless, unless you put it. So I think we are moving in that direction and the funding agencies are moving in that direction as well. Thank you. And Arturo? You will have the final word on this question. Yes, you mentioned something that attracts my attention right away, which is transparency. And I think that this fundamental in business world, and even as a small business owner, I think that you make a very important point. But I think that, let me put it that way very bluntly, I think that we as a scientist, sometimes we fail, and we fail a lot communicating this to the communities. I bet you if we get out here right now, this compound, and we're asking people, what do you think about two degrees? Or, or one and a half degrees, half of these people say, what are you talking about? So I think that we fail in communicating this basic science. Uh, in the Inter-American Institute, we have been trying to communicate the science in Latin America. And for example, today we launch a, a, an online massive course in Spanish with 22 of our researchers and eight countries and 22 institutions to actually try to bring that knowledge into the community into the guy in the bus that can has internet and he can learn a little bit more about what is sea level rising, what it means uh, uh, that the glaciers are melting. I mean, what that means to everybody. So I think that this element of transparency has to go across all the way into the civil society. And, and the education component of climate change is something that we are failing. Uh, and uh, I don't want to sound like Donald Trump because it's really bad, but, but uh, uh, I think that we really need to pay attention to that. And I think that they, with the AI, we tried to do a, to put a little bit of grain uh, on, on that direction, communicating this kind of elements to the Latin American community. But we are far away to achieve full transparency. I totally agree with you. Thank you very much. So now we are, we are arriving to the last five minutes of this uh, session of questions and answers. So I suggest we take the final question and just in the back of the room here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Natalia, and I'm a master's student from the Netherlands studying renewable energy. And my question is, uh, what is your opinion on such controversial research as uh, geoengineering, for instance, and solar radiation management? And do you think we need more research in this area? So the question is about uh, geoengineering and solar radiation management. And what is your position about the need for more research in that direction? Who would like to start? Jochem. It was addressed in the chapter on clouds and aerosols in the uh, fifth assessment report of the IPCC after intensive discussions amongst the authors of, of the report, I have to say. So Jochem, what, what is your Well, 10 years position? ago, there, there was a bit of a discussion whether one should uh, do research or whether the research wouldn't, in a way, uh, make make the, the thinking about geoengineering uh, acceptable, but I think essentially with Paul Kutzen's paper from 10 years ago, the cat was out of the bag, and I don't think we have any option except to do the research to try to understand what might happen. The problem is that, geo, especially solar radiation management, lends itself to unilateral application, and I think if we do not understand what the consequences are, we are in a bad position possibly to counter unilateral decisions. So, so I believe the research is essential so that we have good arguments for not doing it. That is, <laughs> I am absolutely convinced that will be the outcome. The more we know, the more arguments we will have for not doing it, especially solar radiation management. The, the more robust our, our knowledge is, the better arguments we will have. Thank you for this clear statement. Uh, Irene, you wanted to comment? Any other willing to comment on this question? No? Okay, so now I'm turning to our uh, person from uh, early career scientists and you wanted to come back to the panel, so you will have the final word. Okay, lucky me. Um, I, we, you, the panelists touched on how I could further my early scientific career, but I'm also very interested in helping my colleagues not 
I'm not pressuring them to pursue a degree in climate science, but just so that they're aware of it. I mean, I have people in physics come up to me like, oh, I might go into climate science because I hear there, there's jobs there. And they don't, that's an afterthought. It's not like, oh, climate science is really cool or it exists really. It's like, oh, okay, if thermal doesn't work out, I'll go to climate science. <laughs> so. Yes, who would? Erica? I think as we've shown here as a panel and from the questions you've heard, climate science can really encompass a lot more than just physics. And so um, it would be interesting to understand what their backgrounds are, what their interests would be, um, you know, climate adaptation, uh, climate communications. Uh, we have a lot of need uh, as we move forward here. So I think the uh, breakthroughs, this was mentioned before, um, by early career, um, that's an area that ha has strong support uh, financially. Um, typically, you'll see support for students to go to meetings. Um, there are a lot of mid-career scientists that would like that support, I think, in this day and time. So um, I think climate science, it's almost like saying science. Um, it's got <laughs> that, that level of um, uh, grayness to it. And so I would just encourage them to, to find the motivation that most speaks to them. And certainly within our context, there is that breadth of interest, whether you're looking at climate from an oceans perspective, from an economic perspective, uh, from translating decisions to indigenous peoples, working with uh, stakeholder communities, working with industry, um, there's certainly a lot of potential. Thank you very much. Uh, David, would you like to have a final word? You'll... I'm going to address this question. Um, you'll need an observational record and you'll find out that it has a 10-year gap right in the middle where you can't do anything about it. Um, you're going to build a climate model that's so elaborate that you can't get time from your climate center to actually run it. <laughs> and once you have a publishable piece, you're going to find that no journal will take it. Okay? <laughs> so other than that, we think that this is exactly the right science, exactly the right topics, um, and exactly the right contribution to society. But but that's that's the message that we're that's the that we're that we're wrestling with. I mean, it's a it's a difficult chance. I only want to say congratulations to you. You've heard seven of the best climate scientists from around the world and got a little an enjoyable piece from each of them. Valerie, it's been my pleasure to work from you with you. Katya and Iksu, thank you very much for getting this organized for all of us. And um, I think most of us are around for a couple of days. Uh, please come and pick our brains. It's really been our pleasure. Thank you very much.